In this lecture, we're going to be talking about urinary incontinence. And I would like to say that this lecture can be expanded beyond OBGYN to all patients with incontinence, with one exception. In order to have stress incontinence, you have to be a woman and you have to have had a bunch of pregnancies. You're going to be able to differentiate all the forms of incontinence based on the symptoms, looking for whether or not the patient senses urge, whether or not there's nocturnal leak, and then you have to decide whether or not the patient warrants systometry or just needs a urinalysis. So as we go through these, keep those things in mind. Let's start with stress incontinence, knowing that you have to be a woman, you have to have had kids in order to get stress incontinence. The pathology is based on having big or multiple births. As we learned in the pelvic anatomy lecture, big and multiple births can stretch the cardinal ligament. And the cardinal ligament is what keeps the bladder and the uterus connected. And so a patient develops a cystocele, and then abdominal pressure becomes translated only to the bladder. Let me show you what this looks like to help you understand a little bit better. A normal patient has a urethra and a bladder, and in the urethra is a sphincter. It overlies the vagina. In a patient who has had multiple large births who stretch the cardinal ligament, you get a cystocele. It has to be high grade, and the bladder stays where it is. So high-grade cystocele drops the sphincter into the vagina. In a normal patient, abdominal pressure is translated to the bladder and to the sphincter, such that the sphincter closes. Now with the cystocele, that abdominal pressure is translated to the bladder, but not to the sphincter. So every time she increases intra-abdominal pressure, a little bit of fluid leaks out, which is why the pres patient presentation is sneeze and pee. The patient will complain of a brief loss of urine when intra-abdominal pressure increases, when she sneezes, when she coughs, when she plays tennis. Anything that increases the intra-abdominal pressure is going to cause her to lose a little bit of urine. This loss of urine will not be associated with the urge to void, and it is not nocturnal. She retains all her normal function except that whenever she exerts herself and increases her intra-abdominal pressure, she pees. The diagnosis, on physical exam, you're, you're going to see the cystocele. Remember, you must have a cystocele in order to have stress incontinence. A urinalysis will be normal, and she does not need a urinalysis. She does not need cystometry, which will also be normal. All you have to do is the Q-tip test. That is, you place a Q-tip on the urethra and ask her to cough. If it turns more than 30 degrees, the diagnosis of stress incontinence is fulfilled and you can treat her. The treatment is based on the pathology. Because you have a weakened pelvic floor from the stretching of the cardinal ligament, you can attempt to strengthen the pelvic floor using pessaries. Pessaries generally don't work and eventually you'll have to rebuild her pelvic floor with surgery either the MMK procedure or the birch. This is the only type of incontinence that necessitates being female. The rest of this discussion can be applicable to all patients, including men. The next one we're going to talk about is hypertonic, also called motor urge. The pathology is based on a spasmodic bladder. There's random spastic contractions of the detrusor muscle. Such that these contractions occur at all volumes. And the patient doesn't know when they're going to come, but the patient does know 
that when a contraction is occurring, there is definitely the urge to go. And because these contractions can occur randomly and at any time, there will be nocturnal symptoms. And they pee whenever it spasms, which can be random and uncontrolled. When trying to diagnose them, their physical exam will be normal, as will the urinalysis. If you suspect hypertonic or motor urge incontinence, you do want to use systometry that will definitively diagnose them. You don't need to do systometry because you can usually get it from the history, but this is the best test. I'll show you what systometry looks like in just a second. Because it's caused by spastic bladder, give antispasmodic agents. Knowing that if you give too much antispasmodic medication, you will reduce the detrusor muscle to zero and cause the next kind of incontinence, hypotonic or overflow. But let me show you what systometry looks like. You have the patient urinate so that the starting volume of urine is very low. Eventually, the kidneys will continue to make urine and the volume of the bladder will increase. It will max out eventually. What hypertonic or motor urge looks like is random contractions of the detrusor muscle that occur at all volumes and totally randomly. And with each contraction, there'll be loss of urine, which is why you give antispasmodics to prevent it. But you have to be careful because if you give too much antispasmodic medication, you may induce the next kind of incontinence, hypotonic or overflow. The pathology here is that the detrusor muscle contractions are absent. This is usually the result of some neural injury. And whether it's trauma or multiple sclerosis or any other neurologic injury doesn't make a difference. Either the patient can't feel that they're full to initiate a contraction, or they may even be able to feel they're full, they just can't initiate that contraction because of the neural injury. There are no contractions of the bladder. So what happens is that the bladder fills and leaks a little bit of urine before it explodes. It stretches the bladder to its limits and the wall tension of the bladder itself contracts down and squirts out just enough urine to reduce it below that maximum tension. Of course, within minutes, it's over the limit again and contracts once again. So it is not detrusor muscle contractions, but actually the wall tension of the bladder that causes the incontinence. The patient is going to leak throughout the day. It won't be continuous, but it will be fairly regular. The patient generally does not have the urge to void and will have nocturnal symptoms. The diagnosis on physical exam will be normal. If you're really good, you can feel the distended bladder, but you probably won't be able to. But what you could find is another focal neurologic deficit indicative of the spinal lesion leading to this problem. The urinalysis will be normal and generally is not needed. Diagnosis is made on systometry. I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. The treatment is to cause spasm and that is with bethanicol. But most of these patients require a permanent Foley catheter, such that we constantly drain the bladder mechanically rather than asking them to do it. Systometry, again, you have them pee to a low level, low volume. Over time, the kidneys make urine and the volume will increase and it reaches a maximum level. And it's here at the maximum level where you'll see some variation in the volume. 
because there are no contractions throughout the rest of the cycle. But what will happen at maximum is that you'll exceed the maximum wall tension and the patient will urinate. They'll develop some more urine, exceed the maximum wall tension, urinate, and so on and so forth until you place a Foley and drain them. Hypotonic and hypertonic are thus named because they are direct opposites of one another, their diagnosis and treatment being completely opposite. We're going to close with two other kinds of incontinence that are found in anybody. The first is irritative bladder. And this really isn't an incontinence. It's just the patient really has to go and sometimes they can't make it. The pathogenesis is just that. It's irritation from inflammation. What that means, stones, UTIs, and cancer. The patient is gonna present with frequency, urgency, and dysuria. So there will be urge, but there will not be nocturnal symptoms. You're not going to leak at night. It may wake you up with frequency, urgency, and dysuria, but you're not going to leak at night. The diagnosis is going to show most likely a normal physical. And the urinalysis is going to show you the diagnosis. There's no need to do a systometry. If it is due to a UTI, you'll want the urine culture. You're going to treat a urinary tract infection either with a fluoroquinolone like Cipro, Bactrim, or nitrofurantoin. See the medicine lectures on UTIs for more details. And of course, there's going to be some follow-up needed for the stones and the cancer. Again, that's covered in medicine videos. And the last, time of, last cause of incontinence is going to be fistulas. And fistulas occur, occur in inflammatory diseases. It is usually status post radiation or an irritable bowel disease like Crohn's. The patient is going to have a continuous leak. And they have a continuous leak because a fistula is an epithelialized connection between one organ and another. In this case, you will have a connection between the, between the bladder and anything else. It can be from the bladder to the skin, from the bladder to the rectum, or from the bladder to the vagina. And regardless, when you have just a tube connecting the bladder to something else, there's no sphincter. So it can just flow out. There'll be a continuous leak, but they'll also have normal function. That is, they'll be able to feel the need to void, and they can void just fine. So there's no urge associated with that continuous leak, and it will be nocturnal because it's continuous throughout the day. You do not need a urinalysis, and you do not need systometry. You'll perform a physical exam where you'll actually be able to probe the fistula. But sometimes the fistula will be in the vagina or the rectum, which is very poorly accessible. So what you can do is the tampon test. You insert a tampon where you think the fistula is connected to, then you inject a blue dye in through the urethra. There should be no connection between the bladder and wherever the tampon is. So if the tampon turns blue, you know that a fistula is present. The treatment for a fistula is a fistulotomy. So we've talked about a number of causes of incontinence. Only one is unique to women, and that is stress incontinence. They have to have had pregnancies and delivered birth. All the other forms are just incontinence that can be applied to anybody. You can see that you can differentiate these different diseases based on the presence of urgency and how they lose incontinence. That is, when do they leak? And then you need to be able to decide who gets a urinalysis and systometry. Finally, for bonus points, Remember that both fistulas 
And stress incontinence can be diagnosed definitively just with a physical exam, stress incontinence with the Q-tip test, and fistulas with the tampon test. That is incontinence. We make these videos for free, and we need your help. Please donate, because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.